thank you. Um, so yeah, just for those of you that aren't volunteers, I think most of you are now, because I can see your lovely faces. Um, this is part of our Wilder Future for Warwickshire project funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund um, at Warwickshire Wildlife Trust, uh, basically training young adults in conservation and giving you the skills and confidence to go out and spread the word about it and raise awareness. Um, so this is one of our sort of ecology based webinars. Moving forward into the future, we'll be doing a lot more of the media and comm side of things. Um, but uh, this is still covering sort of species that you, you might see and you might want to survey for. Uh, if you are interested in joining and you haven't already, um, our web page is, is just in the middle here so that you can uh, have a look and that has got details on, on how you sign up for that. Um, also, if you do want to uh, post on social media about tonight or about the project in general, and you can use our hashtags over on the left here, Wilder Feature, Wilder Warwickshire, and of course National Lottery Heritage Fund. That one's a bit more of a mouthful. Um, but you can also um, do it on our social media, which we've got YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. We're also on LinkedIn if you're on there as well. Um, and those are our, our tags there. So please do, uh, you know, feel free to, to tweet and Instagram about it if, if you would like. Obviously, tonight is all about reptiles, as I've said, uh, with, with Ben from Frog Life. Um, so that should be really good and lots of lots of knowledge um, for you to take on board, similar to the amphibian one. In terms of reptiles in Warwickshire, um, so if you do want to, to see some of the habitat, at least, or you might be lucky enough to see some of the actual reptiles themselves. Um, I've just kind of put on a few places here. Um, that we can always add to our usual follow-up email, so don't worry too much about writing them down. Um, but Brandon Marsh, um, if you if you do get the chance to go when it's open again, um, is generally pretty good for reptiles. It's got quite mixed habitat, and um, we do tend to see quite a few grass snakes there. Um, on the kind of other side of the spectrum, if anyone's been to Abbey Green Park, it's quite a different um, kind of much smaller reserve and um, more urban. We also get grass snakes there, which shows you the sort of range of, of um, places that you might find them. Also, Lem Valley, uh, big reserve, uh, varied habitat, um, but lots of sort of grassland in there. Um, at Brandon Reach, our newer reserve across the road from Brandon Marsh, if you haven't been yet, um, we, we apparently get slow worms, which is quite exciting. Um, and you can also find slow worms at Kenilworth Common as well as uh, common lizards. Uh, so you might see some of our, our reptiles there, which is um, exciting. And sometimes you might see grass snakes swimming, which is quite cool, which is just the random picture that I decided to include. Um, terribly pixelated from having been taken on my iPhone whilst I was out, um, but it was good fun to see. Um, but in terms of us managing our habitat for reptiles, um, it's similar in the sense to what I said about us managing the habitat for amphibians in that we kind of have to do lots of overall management of, of habitat for lots and lots of different species and groups. Um, but what we try to do is keep the habitat relatively diverse where we can um, to increase um, the kind of amount of biodiversity that we have. So in terms of our management of our reserves for reptiles, um, it's generally focused more on grassland. Um, so we try and have some, some open kind of basking spots as it were um, that they feel quite safe in and that they can go to to warm up. Um, and we generally tend to cut most of our grass and meadows and things just once a year um, in the summer between mid July and August. Um, we try and keep those grasslands relatively open. So we do do some scrub clearance to stop them just becoming scrub basically and getting scrubbed over. However, we don't just get rid of all the scrub and um, we try and have a bit of diversity um, and scrub can be quite good um, for, for reptiles. Um, so that it can provide a bit of shelter and depending on how it's um, distributed in the landscape it can actually be used as, as corridors um, so we tend to have to uh, clear the scrub out of bird nesting season as, as you would uh, imagine um, but we tend to try and leave certain areas and kind of cut it on rotation. Uh, we also um, try and keep some, some uh, dead wood and dead vegetation um, habitat piles, uh, when we when we do maintenance of things, so maybe we do a bit of coppicing or something, we'll tend to pile things up um, and we make uh, dead hedges that we mentioned in one of our webinars before out of some of the dead material. Um, and again, these might be used as corridors, but they might actually be used as hibernation areas, as it were, um, for some of these reptiles. And as I mentioned, grass snakes, um, they do like water. 
Um, so sometimes our water bodies can be good places. Um, so uh, we try and um, maintain those as well, which we talked a, a bit about a bit more um, when we discussed uh, the amphibians. And sometimes, apparently, uh, reptiles may lay their eggs in compost heaps. I've never seen this, but that would be quite cool. Um, but I'm sure they do. They're like warmer places, aren't they? So that um, they can kind of incubate their eggs. Um, and in, um, we don't tend to kind of make mass compost heaps at the trust uh, when we do our maintenance. But we do do things like grass piles and vegetation piles, which might have a, a similar impact and might be a similar place for them to, to incubate their eggs. Um, so, yeah, just a bit about um, the kind of management that we might do, but I'm sure Ben will touch on management a little bit as well. Um, but in terms of local places, those are the kind of places that you might see them. And we can always send that out in, in an email so that you've got that for reference. OK, so I'll stop sharing my screen there um, and I'll, I'll pass over to Ben. Thank you very much, Deborah. Right. Let's kick it off. Oh, not that slide. There we go. All right, so hopefully you can all see my screen. Um, there might be a column of faces on your right hand side. I would recommend, uh, recommend minimizing this. I'm gonna be throwing up a lot of pictures of, of reptiles on the screen and you want to dedicate most of the screen to those pictures. Talking heads don't really contribute much to this. Um, so welcome to Frog Life's Discovering Reptiles workshop. Um, so I actually have a sort of three to four hour workshop and a one hour uh, webinar that I, I tend to deliver. Uh, so this is a mashup of both of those. And um, so hopefully this will run smoothly. Not gone through it before. Um, but I estimate this should take about two hours. Uh, and we're really going to focus on two aspects uh, of reptiles here. And that's the, the identification um, of the UK natives and non-natives, and then a couple of survey methods on how we might um, survey for a few of those species. So just to give you a very brief introduction to Frogline, um, we are a national wildlife conservation charity. And we have a particular focus on amphibians and reptiles. And we tend to do this in three main ways. We get involved in a lot of practical habitat management. Uh, we put a lot of ponds in the ground. We reconnect areas um, that may have been um, fragmented uh, across our landscape. We do a bit of education as well. This is what this project really falls into, um, workshops and training. And we do a bit of research as well. So recently, uh, we've done a lot of research on the impact uh, roads are having on toads when they're crossing to their uh, breeding ponds. The Discovering Reptiles Project, uh, this is a project that's going to run for two years and really it was put together because we've noticed we get far less records for reptiles uh, than we might want, particularly in comparison to amphibians, which are really easy to or at least um, in comparison, easy to, to survey for. Uh, they tend to congregate in ponds at very specific times of the years, which makes it a lot easier um, for surveyors to, to find where they are and get a good idea of what the numbers are doing. Uh, reptiles are far more cryptic um, and they, they tend to be more spread out across the landscape. It's much harder to find them. Um, and this project really is just about equipping people with the tools to actually go out and survey for reptiles and then encourage them to submit that data. So we're going to start with reptile identification. And we're going to begin with four species and these are what we consider the common or widespread species. When you're out and about, these are the four that you're most likely to come across. You know, 90, 95% of the time, whatever it is you've got, it's likely to be one of these. So the first one is the common lizard. Uh, some people call it the vip viviparous lizard. Um, viviparous meaning it gives birth to live young. So interesting facts about our native reptiles, um, only two of them actually lay eggs. The rest of them will develop their embryos internally, give birth to live young later on in the season. So that's where this common name comes from. Um, 
So the common lizard is quite small. It's only about 13 to 14 centimeters when it's fully grown. And that includes the length of its tail as well. The tail length is about half that of the body. So its body is only about seven or eight centimeters. It is quite a small lizard. And you can see from all the pictures across my screen, they're usually some shade of brown. Sometimes it's dark, sometimes it's light. They'll quite often have specks of yellow or lighter specks on their body, but you get a real variation of color across common lizards. Um, I've seen pictures of green. It's usually quite a dull green. I've seen blue, um, but usually you'll find there's some shade of brown. They tend to have a vertebral line that runs down their back. And you can use this feature to distinguish the females from the males sometimes. This is actually a female we've got here in the center right image. And that vertebral line is quite solid. It's not broken up in places. Okay, the vertebral line on a male is quite often broken up. It's quite choppy. If we look at this image in the top left, it doesn't even look like it's got a vertebral line at all. It just looks like dots, really. So that's one thing you can sometimes do to tell whether you've got a male or female. There are a couple of other things as well. Females tend to have these dark colored flanks. So you can see here on the, this female, they have almost black flanks here. That's quite often just dark brown. The males on the other hand, tend not to have such a difference between the flanks and the top of the body. But they do tend to have more flex and spots overall. And they'll sometimes have this bulge at the base of the tail, uh, particularly around the breeding season. So there's a few things you can do to tell the difference between males and females. Certainly not foolproof. Um, lots of people get it wrong, <laughs> um, including me. Uh, it's far easier to tell the difference later on in the season when the female um, has developed her eggs and she's fit to burst and she looks very, very swollen. And I think I have a picture of that later on um, in, the, in the workshop. So they can often be mistaken for newts. This is the one species you're likely to um, mistake with a newt. You may have noticed I've not spoken about this image in the bottom left. That is because this is a newt. And there's a few key differences. Um, if you're in the field, the first thing I would recommend is just walk up. Walk up to whatever you've found. Uh, particularly if it's a warm day, the lizard, if it is a lizard, will just run off. It will give you absolutely no chance of getting near it or capturing it. Uh, and newts, on the other hand, they're very slow and sluggish on land. Uh, and if you approach it, there's nothing it can really do to stop you from picking it up. Uh, lizards, on the other hand, will, they, I mean, there's pictures of them in hands here. But usually you can only get hold of them on very cold days when they're really sluggish and you just don't have the energy to move on. The other thing you can do uh, is look at the, the skin as well. You can see across all of these lizard pictures, uh, the individual scales that they have. They have really um, prominent scales on their skin, uh, whereas newts just have very smooth skin, absolutely no scales whatsoever. In fact, when they're on land and their skin's quite dry, it's almost velvety to the touch. And when they're either in water or they've just come out of water, that's very wet and sleek. And then finally, and this is more of a pub quiz fact than anything else, if you count the front toes of a newt, you'll find they have four. If you count the front toes of a lizard, you'll find that they have five. So I've never known anyone that uses that as an sort of ID feature when they're in the field. Um, and this, by the way, top right image, this is a juvenile. This is um, a neonate, so it's been born, been born very recently. Uh, they're born almost entirely black, uh, melanistic almost, and then they will grow into their adult coloration as they grow older. So moving on to another lizard species. And um, one of everybody's favorite facts is, is that slow worms are not snakes, they are legless lizards. They superficially resemble snakes. Um, what does that mean? It means that they lost the use of their legs um, in evolutionary time a lot more recently than modern snakes have. 
Okay, so they have they share some features with lizards that they don't share with snakes. Um, and this is because they are what we what we consider semi fossorial, meaning they spend a lot of time uh, underground or beneath the layers of things that are on the ground, such as scrub, grass and um, logs. And their legs were just getting in the way. So they uh, gradually over time lost the use of them. So they are considered a lizard. Uh, and they grow much bigger than the common lizards. They can grow up to 50 centimetres when they're fully grown. So they are quite sizable. It's far easier to tell the difference between the males and females. This is a female here in the top left. Females are far better looking, in my opinion, uh, than the males, which is quite surprising. It's usually the males that, that tend to be the, the colourful ones. The females are normally this beautiful bronze, golden colour with these darker brown uh, coloured flanks and you'll sometimes find they have a vertebral line as well. You can just about see that on top of her head there, that dark line here, sometimes that extends further down the body. Males on the other hand, they're a sort of uniform colour, uh, usually some shade of brown or grey. Um, this is a male here in the bottom image. This one does actually have some really beautiful blue flecking. Um, not all males develop this, some males will. Uh, it's only the males that develop it. So if you see a slow one with blue on it, it it's definitely a male. Um, but some males just won't develop this at all. Some males will develop, you know, one or two blotches. Uh, it's very subtle in comparison to this image here. The juveniles are really small. They're really they're only about four to eight centimeters in length. Um, and they are this golden color with this jet black vertebral line with these jet black flanks. So the image is a bit blurred, but you can see that line extending all the way down the body. And that's, that tends to be what they look like. And as they grow older, they'll develop their adult coloration. So like I mentioned, this is the species uh, you're most likely to confuse um, as, a, as a snake. But the key differences tend to be that it's got a very stumpy looking head and body. It almost looks like the head and body have no distinction. Uh, when we see a few images of snakes in the next few slides, you'll see that their heads look far more distinctive uh, than slow worms do. Uh, but unlike snakes, uh, slow worms can blink. So snakes actually have a scale over their eye, meaning that they don't have to clear the lens of their eye um, with an eyelid, whereas lizards um, don't have that at all. They don't have a scale over their eye. They actually have eyelids that they use to clear their lens um, if you look at a, a slow worm long enough, it will inevitably blink, giving it away as a slow worm and not a snake. Moving on to the first of our uh, common and widespread snake species, the grass snake. This is a whopper of a reptile. Um, the females can grow up to a meter and a half. It's quite rare to, to see them that big, uh, but they can grow very sizable. Um, so it's the females that are, are usually about a third bigger than the males. Uh, most of the, the adult grass snakes you find will be between sort of half a metre to a metre. And they're usually this quite distinctive green uh, or dark olive colour. You can see that really clearly across all three of these images here, this dark green olivish colour. Um, but the main identifying feature is this yellow collar behind the head. So we've got it here on this image, there in the top left, and there on the top right. You're not going to see a snake in this country um, with a yellow collar that is any other species than a grass snake, okay? And quite often you'll be working with very limited information. Uh, most reptiles we see will, will whiz off very quickly. Um, and you're looking for these, these key identifying features, okay? And that yellow collar is a giveaway when it comes to the grass snake. A secondary to this yellow collar, uh, you can actually use the dark bars on their flanks. These black lines here, you see it really clearly on this bottom one. From these top down images, you can just about see these dark lines on the flanks of the snake. Um, and that gives it part of its common name as well. So in this country, we have what we call the barred grass snake. And it's due to these bars that you find on them. Um, so the juveniles, I'm not sure if this is a juvenile or just a close-up, um, 
the juveniles are like little miniature adults, they're about 20 centimetres, but they'll still have that yellow collar and the same overall green, dark olive coloration. Now you can tell the difference between males and females uh, just by looking, um, but it is quite difficult. So you need to look at either end of the snake. And once again, we'll start with the females. This is a female we've got here in the top left. They have very stubby tails. Okay, so believe it or not, snakes actually have tails. Uh, they have a head, they have a body, and they have a tail. Uh, and without technical examination, you can see on a female round about where the body tapers off into the tail because it happens very suddenly. Okay, so quite a thick set body. And I would say around here, it starts to taper off quite rapidly into the tail. So females have shorter, stubbier tails in comparison to their bodies. But if you look at their head as well, female grass snakes' heads are described as arrow head shaped, it's the shape of an arrow. Um, and you can see the distinction between the head and the body very easily there. Um, very skinny neck with a very chunky head on top of it. And the males, by comparison, uh, even though it's, it's far more distinctive than the slow worm, um, the head meeting the body, they have very skinny heads and there's no jutting out of the head where it meets, it meets the body. And their tail as well, tapers are far more gradual and they have a, a far longer tail in comparison uh, to the body length. And so there's a few things you can maybe do to identify whether it is a male, a male or female, but it does take uh, quite a bit of experience. <laughs> And sometimes you just need a male and a female side by side, really, to tell the difference. So the grass snake may be confused with the adder, um, but the, the overall coloration is very different, as we'll see in the next few slides. But also the grass snake has these circular pupils with these yellow irises. OK. We'll compare that to the adder uh, later on in the workshop. Um, so they are generally found in lowland areas, you, you, you don't get them anywhere um, high up and you, you tend to find them around water. And the reason for this is they, they are amphibian specialists and uh, they tend to eat frogs, newts, they've been known to take fish as well. Um, so they, they tend to be found where their food is. Um, and just to, to confuse you, in 2017, um, so very, very recently, um, there was a study released um, based on whether we should reclassify our subspecies of grass snake as a full species. Okay, so map of Europe here, all of these different shapes um, are, are samples of grass snakes with the different shapes and the different colours mean there's a different lineage of grass snakes. And it was suggested that there is enough DNA evidence to separate western grass snakes in central Europe to eastern grass snakes. OK, so all these blue triangles here, these are samples of what we consider barred grass snake. And these yellow circles, uh, these are mainly grass snakes, but that red star and those green boxes, those are subspecies of grass snake. Bit confusing, uh, the media had a bit of a frenzy. Um, there were lots of stories about us gaining a new reptile species. Um, that's not quite the case, it's just that the researchers believe there was enough of a genetic distinction between populations of grass snake across Europe that we consider them separate species. Um, and it was passed, they, they, that was accepted. So our grass snake, the scientific name is, is Natrix helvetica. Some people call it the barred grass snake. Absolutely no need, in my opinion, to call it the barred grass snake, you can still call it the grass snake. But in most of Eastern Europe and parts of Central Europe, you get the grass snake, Natrix, Natrix. And the main physical difference is just they lack those bars I was talking about earlier. They don't have those dark lines along the length of the body. They tend to have a thicker, more prominent yellow collar um, just behind their head as well. You may have noticed <laughs> there's a red star in England here. The researchers, when they took their samples, found um, a population of these non-native grass snakes here in the UK. OK, so I wouldn't really consider it a 
non-native species because I don't I don't know where that sample was taken. I don't know anything about it. But the researchers did find non-native um, grass snakes here in the UK. But 99% of the time, if you see a grass snake in this country, it is going to be this. OK, it's very unlikely to be this, but there is some evidence that they are present here. No one knows how, no one knows when. No one's done any follow up research, really. We don't know whether they're interbreeding um, with our native grass snakes or, or whether they compete or, or anything. There's, there's no information out there. Um, so I'm sorry, I can't really tell you more about it. There's that. Um, and moving on to our last not common species, but we would certainly consider it widespread across the UK. You do get these um, in the majority of, of counties in the UK although they have been extirpated uh, from a few places. The adder, a bit smaller than our grass snake, only when it's fully grown, 60 to 80 centimetres, but it's a far stockier snake than the grass snake. It has this really thick set build. Um, most grass snakes you see will be dead skinny, whereas the, the adders uh, have these real fat bodies. And it's usually very easy to tell the difference between males and females. This is a male here on the right hand side. They tend to be this greyish, silverish colour, almost metallic looking, and they'll have a black zigzag pattern running down their body. Whereas the females are usually a light brown in their body coloration with a darker brown zigzag. Females will sometimes have a black zigzag as well, just to make things a little bit confusing, uh, but they tend to, to stick to this light brown, dark brown patterning. And it is that zigzag pattern that you want to be looking out for on the adder. Um, you can't see it clearly on any of these images, but it starts with an upside down V shape on top of their head. And then that zigzag pattern runs down on top of their body um, right down to the, the tail. And that zigzag pattern is quite different across individuals. Sometimes it's wavy and it looks more like S's than V's. Sometimes it's very sharp and jagged. But some form of zigzag pattern is usually present. This is the juvenile we've got here in the top left uh, and they're usually what, what's considered a brick red colour or ginger colour. They have these um, zigzag patterns just like the adults but they tend to be that colour. Um, and I mentioned the eye as well earlier on, just look at how dangerous that eye is. That is an eye that screams, please don't come any closer. I am the UK's only venomous snake, which it is, um, but they have very different eye shapes and eye colours to, to grass snakes. So when you are looking at them, uh, that's another identifying feature you can use. And the fact that it is our only native venomous snake is uh, a bit, bit misrepresented. Uh, a lot of people think they're very dangerous, when in actual fact, you can count on one hand how many deaths have, have happened in the last you know, 50 or so years. Just the number of recorded bites to humans is very, very low. And the majority of bites happen to dogs who are very inquisitive and curious by nature. Uh, and they will sniff, they will pat, and they will just not leave an adder alone. And that is the only time an adder is going to really strike out and bite. If you disturb an adder, the first thing it's going to do is slither away. Um, it is not going to immediately get aggressive. It's, it's only after repeated disturbance that it will eventually get aggressive and then eventually bite you. So the majority of incidents happen on dogs. We just perhaps need a bit more interpretation on our site as to how to handle your dogs um, on a site that adders are present. Okay, we're going to move on to the less common and rare species and you, you're just not going to find these um, in, in Warwickshire really. Um, they, are, I think that's actually, let's just go straight into the slides because I talk about where they are actually. Um, and I'm not going to spend too long on this. Like I say, you're not really going to find these in your surveys. But sand lizards um, tend to be found on lowland heathland in the south of England, uh, but also in co on coastal dunes on the, particularly the west coast of Wales and England as well. So they're a bit more widespread than, than smooth snakes, uh, but they are limited to these habitats. Um, they look quite a bit different to, to the common lizards. Um, the main two features are in the males, 
they will develop these bright green flanks during the breeding season. If you find a green common lizard, they tend to be one, dull green, and it tends to be all over their body as well. In the sand lizards, the male will not develop green on top. Okay, it's just on their flanks. And this is to provide it a bit of um, camouflage from, from aerial predators, as they are quite often found on coastal sand dunes. Uh, you can see how easily they'll blend in from a bird's eye view there. The second ident identifying feature is that they lack a vertebral line and they tend to have these what we call eye spots. Okay, so the eye spot in this central image is this white or, or cream coloured centre and then this darker splodge surrounding it. And they do look quite varied depending on the individual, but you tend to have one line of them on the top and then one line of eye spots on either side on the flanks as well. Um, it can be a bit confusing because I've seen some common lizards that do have something that might resemble eye spots, particularly on male common lizards when they have a lot of flex on them. Um, but they tend to lack this, this coloration, this light coloured centre with the dark outside. Uh, and our smooth snake, probably our rarest terrestrial uh, reptile. We, we didn't even know about the species until the 1800s, really. Um, that's how few there are within, within England. They are only found on mature heathland and adjacent habitat uh, in, in the south of England. OK, so they're only on three, maybe four counties in England. They are really rare. Uh, both of these are, are very, very well protected. OK, but you can tell a smooth snake from uh, the grass snake or, or the adder because uh, it tends to have this double row of spots that run down its body. So you see these dark spots here. But they'll sometimes have this dark heart shape on top of their head as well. Hopefully you can follow my mouse cursor. You see this here. And they'll have an eye stripe as well. Not always. They don't always have this heart shaped crest. They don't always have this eye stripe. They'll tend to have this dark row of spots. Bit of a boring looking snake if you ask me in comparison. Um, that's how you tell the difference between smooth snakes, adders and grass snakes. And then finally, and this is this is one everybody forgets, including me, uh, the leatherback turtle is actually considered a native reptile uh, to the UK. It will come to the coast um, to, to feed on, on jellyfish, um, mostly on the west side of the UK uh, and Ireland. Um, but they will not come ashore. They only come ashore really. It's just the females that do so to lay their eggs. And they tend to only do that in, I think it's tropical regions and sub, possibly subtropical regions as well. But they're a huge reptile. They are about two meters in length. They are the, the biggest reptile outside of anything crocodilian. Um, they're real hefty, hefty beasts. There have been other turtles that have been recorded in UK waters. Uh, but they tend to be considered vagrant. They're either very old or ill um, and have been sort of washed along by uh, some strong currents and probably don't have long left to live really. So they're not really found feeding in UK waters. Okay, so those are all the native species of reptile to the UK. Um, and there are quite a number of non-native um, or introduced species. And I'm just gonna touch on a few that have um, well-known populations throughout the UK, but there are others that have been um, released by, by pet owners, um, but there tends not to be a persistent colony of these, or you know, they might have just been released and they'll survive a year or two, but due to our quite harsh winters, um, they may die. So the first of these is the war lizard. Uh, we get the war lizard uh, in the Channel Islands, actually, so it's not strictly a, a non-native species, but it has been introduced to mainland UK and they are found across a number of sites, but you're most likely to encounter them on the south coast, around Southampton, Bournemouth, and that area of the country. So these two images here are war lizards. Um, we have two varieties of them. We've got a variety that's been um, linked to populations in France, and some that are linked to populations in, in Italy. And this is the Italian one here. The Italian one is actually green, or at least some individuals develop this green coloration, whereas the French ones are all brown like this here. 
and they're a bit bigger than our common lizards. Um, but the main differences are the habitat they're found in. So a wall lizard is really only found in urban or rocky environments. It really lives up to its name uh, and it likes to be on walls, it likes to be on rock faces, uh, and you'll quite often see it hanging vertically um, quite happily uh, for lengths of time on, on rocks and on, on walls. Whereas a common lizard won't really do this. It doesn't like to be vertical, it likes to be horizontal, and it doesn't even particularly like climbing. Uh, common lizards will climb a little bit to maybe get to the sunniest patch. They certainly won't be um, traversing, you know, really high heights. The wall lizard uh, has a longer tail in comparison to its body. Its tail makes about two thirds of its overall length. You can see in this image here, that tail trailing off in the background. This tail belonging to this brown individual on the right hand side, trailing off here. Really long tails in comparison to, to common lizards. It also has really long limbs, a long neck and head, and longer toes as well. Look how spindly those toes are. Um, if you see a common lizard, they'll quite often have short, stumpy little legs or short, stumpy little toes. Um, and that's the main difference, really. They have stumpier features, whereas wall lizards have longer features. Okay, but it is quite confusing. Sometimes when you see a picture of a wall lizard, it may resemble a common lizard and vice versa. Um, the green lizards, again, we get these on the, the Channel Islands, um, but they've, they've been introduced to uh, the south of the, the UK. That tends to be only the only region of the, the country you'll find them. Uh, so a bit rarer than our wall lizards. You're just not going to confuse them with, any, with anything else, really. Um, big lizards, about 35 centimetres in length, and they have that beautiful green coloration. Uh, look at how fancy that lizard looks. Um, this is a male. The males have developed this, this blue coloration on their, their cheeks and their, their neck. Um, the females look quite similar with this bright green body colour. This is the only sort of non-native snake uh, I've included in this workshop. Um, it's the Asculapian snake. It is native to, to mainland Europe, um, even bigger than our grass snake when fully grown. They can grow up to two metres in length. Um, and they're really only found in a couple of sites in the UK. Um, all of the sites they're associated with are close to zoos. So I'm not sure if there's something going on there. Um, but they're quite fond of trees. You'll find them in trees quite often. And they tend to have this greenish coloration, but not that dark olive green that the grass snake has, but more of a dull gray green, I would call that. They'll sometimes have this eye stripe as well. And they'll quite often have this, it's called stippling, this white stippling throughout the body. It's these white dots in between their scales. Quite a nondescript snake, if you ask me. Um, if you want to see them, it's Regent's Park in London and uh, yeah, Colwyn Bay in, in Wales that you'll find these. Those are the only known populations. And then finally, we've got a couple of um, turtle species, uh, or terrapins as they're fondly known. Um, the red eared terrapin here in the top um, is most likely a result of pet releases. Whether or not that's due to the teenage mutant hero craze in the 80s, I don't know. Um, but they get quite big and aggressive when they grow older. Um, and they don't make ideal pets for children as they will snap at your fingers. But they'll be found in, um, in lakes, in ponds, um, probably sewer systems, in, in really slow moving water, they, they tend to be found. Um, but it's that red patch behind the eye that gives them away as a red terrapin. As opposed to the European pond turtle um, down here, which have been introduced to some places. Um, they, they did used to be present here in the UK. There's evidence that they, they did exist um, around the time of the last ice age. Um, but they, they died out just because of the climate, really. Um, both of these species really struggle to lay eggs and for those eggs to incubate well uh, because of how cold it is during our summer months, really. So these are the two sort of terrapin species you might see in our water bodies. I would say the red terrapin is probably the one you're most likely to see. Uh, you may see the, the European pond turtle as well. But you can tell the difference because it has a sort of darker shell 
darker front flippers, these yellow blotches all over its face and its shell as well. Okay, so that's the identification uh, section over really. Um, so that, that concludes how to identify our common species, some of our non-natives and some of our rarer species as well. And there's just a few more slides uh, before we take a 10 minute break. Um, we're going to very, very, very quickly just run over the ecology, some, some of the ecology of reptiles. Um, so the life cycle of our reptiles and by and large, they follow the same pattern year on year. And this does vary slightly depending on the species. But you'll find that most of them are going to leave their hibernation sites any time between February all the way up to April. OK, and the ones that are going to leave them first um, are probably the adders, followed by the common lizards and then the slow worms and then the, the grass snakes. OK. Um, and it depends on where you are in the country and it depends on um, the weather that that year really as to how early or how late they actually emerge from their, their hibernating sites. Between March and May, all of the species are going to be thinking about breeding. So the males tend to leave hibernation first. This helps them raise their body condi condition. This helps them uh, with sperm production. So they're going to be leaving the hibernation sites first and this will give them the best chance of securing sort of breeding access to females. And there's different strategies uh, for different reptiles. And just to give you an example, adders will often compete for the same females by dancing. You may have heard of something called the dance of the adders. And this is where two males will actually sort of dance around each other. And all they're trying to do is push the other one to the ground and whoever wins gains access to the, the, the female nearby. Um, on the other hand, grass snakes uh, will form a mating ball where there's loads of males all contending um, for breeding access to one female and they'll sort of create this tangleweed of snakes. Uh, really cool to see if you ever get the, the chance. Um, but there's various breeding strategies based on the, the species in question, uh, but I'm not going to go into any more detail. Between April and August, all the species uh, apart from the grass snake. So really, I'm just talking about a common species here. So the common and widespread species. Um, the, the common lizard, the slow worm, the grass snake and the adder. Um, so out of those four species, the only one that's going to lay its eggs externally is the grass snake. OK, every other one of those species actually carries the eggs around internally. And that's really an adaptation um, to the, the climate here in the UK. We're, really at the northern edge of a lot of these species ranges. The grass snakes are going to lay their eggs uh, anywhere that maintains a really consistent temperature. So we're talking rotting vegetation, compost heaps, manure piles are really good places for grass snakes to lay their eggs. Um, in August and October, you, you tend to get a, a lull in activity because it's so warm. Uh, so you tend not to see reptiles basking as prevalently, um, but also there's less activity because they've, they've probably eaten, they've probably bred, and they just don't have a whole lot to do. So when you're surveying for reptiles, um, July, August are usually bad times to be, to be surveying really, because uh, just, they're just not active. And then from September onwards, you do get this second period of activity where the females would have um, given birth or the eggs would have hatched and you have adults and juveniles alike trying to feed as much as possible um, so that they put on the weight to outlast the winter. OK, so it's a really tumultuous time um, for, for neonates and um, their, their first winter, 80 percent of them are actually not going to survive. This tends to be because they just don't have the calories really to burn for four or five months while they're just not eating. So you get the second peak of activity fueled by feeding. Um, and then anywhere from October to March, reptiles are gonna be overwintering, anywhere that has a real stable temperature. Okay, so they like to be underground. So a pile of deadwood tends not to be great, but deadwood that's partially buried underground is excellent. Um, leaf litter, if it's really extensive, um, mammal burrows, stonework, 
anywhere that provides a void space that is frost free. OK, so they hate frost. They really don't want to have to contend with frost. They don't mind freezing temperatures. OK, but as long as the frost doesn't get to them, they tend to be quite happy. Uh, just touching on some general threats to reptiles, um, like a lot of our wildlife, reptiles are not faring well. And there's a number of reasons as to why this is. Um, the main one, uh, as is the case for a lot of our species, is the loss and degradation of habitat. So changes to agriculture, uh, how we've intensified it over the last 60 to 70 years, changes in forestry, um, we've urbanised a lot of our areas as well, um, so that's not just places where we live, but also um, transport networks as well have, have cut up our landscape and, and removed a lot of good habitat. But to a lesser extent, how we use our green spaces for recreation as well. Um, we, we tend not to really provide habitat when we conserve a green space. Um, it tends to be used for other things. Unsympathetic management for reptiles is a bit of a problem. Uh, when we do have green spaces, a lot of management resolves, revolves around making it look nice and tidy, and that removes areas for them to overwinter, this removes areas for them to lay their eggs, and it removes the variation structure that reptiles need from their habitat. And I just want to point out that we've lost a lot of our heathland over the last hundred years or so. And this has hit reptiles so hard. Um, heathland really provides everything a reptile will ever need in its lifetime. And in fact, the only places um, you'll find all of our UK native terrestrial species uh, are on heathland sites in the south of England. It's the only place they will all coexist because it makes such excellent habitat. And we've lost a lot of it. We, we held a lot of the heathland uh, in Europe in the first place and we've lost I want to say around three quarters at least uh, over the last few hundred years. It makes really good uh, development sites because it's usually well-drained land and you don't need to clear a lot of forest and um, so it's been developed on quite heavily. To a lesser degree um, the fragmentation of our available habitat has really affected um, reptiles as well. So the provision of habitat is always better, but also reptiles really struggle to colonize areas. Even if there's available habitat there, if there's no reptiles present, they'll really struggle to colonize it. And fragmenting our habitat, so by losing linear features that connect habitat um, and dicing them up with, you know, our landscape with roads and, and urban areas means that even when there is good habitat, reptiles are very, um, have a very hard job finding their way there. Um, and this has led to genetic depression in a, in a lot of cases, and um, particularly adders, which are the worst when it comes to moving throughout the landscape. Um, they have, have undergone genetic depression where they will just inbreed their way to oblivion, really. Um, and a lot of sites now have so few adders on that this is almost an ine inevitability, really, and um, this genetic pressure, depression, um, where there's just so, such a, a small amount of genetic diversity in, in that metapopulation um, that abnormalities are, are rife and it only takes one or two for the, for the population then to, to die out. Um, to a lesser degree, predation from domestic cats is a problem. Um, particularly in urban areas where you get slow worms, um, high densities of urban of cats mean you won't get slow worms because cats will just capture them and kill them. Slow worms don't really have a defence uh, against cats and cats will find them. They'll smell them, they'll see them, they'll hear them and then they'll, they'll kill them. Um, so wherever you have a high uh, density of domestic cats, you tend not to get slow worms. Probably less of a problem for other species. Uh, to some degree, reptiles are still persecuted, particularly adders. Um, they're misunderstood. Dog walkers in particular think that they might, might be doing the public a favour by killing adders uh, because they, you know, have heard stories of them biting dogs and they might think they're a dangerous animal and that, you know, they're doing people a favour. 
Again, we just need more interpretation on this, and this will hopefully limit the persecution of, of adders, but possibly other reptiles as well, because people just don't like them. We're also keeping an eye on reptile disease as well. Um, so our friends over at Garden Wildlife Health um, are a bit, bit concerned about this one in particular. So snake fungal infection made its way from America in 2008, I think it was first recorded here. Um, if you ever, if you ever get, if you ever find a dead reptile that you think may have been diseased, please take a picture, um, visit this website and upload the pictures and let them know about it. They do want to make sure that this doesn't spread throughout our uh, native reptiles. Um, yeah, so I don't think it's too much of a problem now, not in the same way that, that chytrid is uh, for, for amphibians, um, but we do want to keep an eye on it. And very briefly, just to, to round off the first section, um, what, are the, what are the good conservation measures we can take for the widespread species? So the slow worm, common lizard, adder and grass snake. So the provision of egg, line, egg laying sites for grass snakes is, is so good. That's the best thing you can do if you know you have grass snakes on your site uh, because there are so few places for them to lay their eggs anymore. So we're talking compost heaps, um, vegetation piles, it tends to need to be green material rather than um, woody or brown material. So grass cuttings, reed cuttings, um, I suppose scrub if it's quite young would be suitable. Uh, but if you can get your whole, if you can get your hands on a big pile of manure, I don't know if you've got like local riding centres, mix that into your green material, um, into your cut vegetation, because manure is one of the best things for, for grass snakes to lay their eggs into really comes out warm, stays warm because of all the cultures um, that are in it and that are still breaking down the material that's, that's passed through the horse. Um, and we used to provide loads of, of manure piles um, over the last few hundred years because we used to use horses a lot more. Uh, they were used for agriculture, they were used for transport. Um, and they think that the, the range of grass snakes is actually, at least the northern range in the UK, um, coincided with, with how often we um, used horses and we, we provisioned egg laying sites for them, probably unknowingly, um, in the form of manure piles. Um, identifying and protecting, protecting hibernation sites, so important. So if you know that a site is used for hibernation, um, particularly for adders, protecting those sites from public disturbance and um, from heavy, heavy mowing or grazing um, is going to be an excellent conservation measure, okay? And then creating more sites where you have populations of reptiles is gonna help them spread as well. Yeah, and limit, so limiting any areas that reptiles are gonna be using for basking, for mowing or grazing. So if you have areas that you know reptiles use for, for basking, particularly early on in the season when they're far less mo mobile um, and they're gonna be stuck to one spot, don't mow on those areas, don't graze on those areas, wait until later on in the year to do your work. Uh, and that's really gonna help the reptiles thrive. And in areas where you have dense scrub or woodland, um, you know, Debbie, she, she mentioned, um, bit, you know, about scrub clearance, that's great, making sure that that scrub and that woodland doesn't encroach on open habitat, but creating south facing and open spaces within um, scrub and woodland, is going to be really useful for reptiles because they'll use those um, places for basking so they will thermoregulate um, and on south facing slopes they absolutely love it and um, that creates what we call a reptile hot spot where you get a disproportionate amount of, of reptile activity on a site because you get really good conditions for them and maybe one of the best things really is just limiting public disturbance where reptiles are known to overwinter, where they're known to bask, uh, where they're known just to be active, okay? Disturbing reptiles too much means they will stop using that area, they'll stop using that site. And so limiting public disturbances is key. We're gonna take a look at a couple of uh, survey methods now. So there's two really, um, I'm going to, uh, sorry, Demi, can we turn the, the, the subtitles off? I'm watching myself speak and it's really, oh, it's really unnerving. Sure, um, I think you should be able to turn it off on yours just by pressing it and pressing hide. 
Okay, uh, let me just stop sharing screen and find out where that is. Um, hide subtype, there we go. <laughs> you know when you, you hear your voice reverberate back to yourself when you're on the phone, it was like a written version. It's very distracting, isn't it? Sorry, yeah. And <laughs> um, for all of you who don't want them up, then you can just press hide. That's where, that's great, thank you. Um, where was I? Right, so we've got red survey methods, we're going to look at two. Um, but before we do that, I just want to touch very brief, briefly on um, thermoregulation and uh, what it is, how reptiles do it. Um, because if we understand how reptiles thermoregulate, we can actually exploit their behaviour um, to suit our surveys, really. So thermoregulation is just the process by which any species manages their temperature. OK, so reptiles are kind of mislabeled as cold blooded. They certainly don't want to be cold blooded. They have a preferred um, temperature range of 25 to 30 centigrade. But they manage their temperature in a very different way to how you and me might do it. So they are ectothermic. Um, they will use their environment to thermoregulate. So mammals can, can use internal processes. We can sweat. Uh, we can actually burn energy to, to heat up. Um, Whereas reptiles can't do this, okay? They just have to rely on other sources of heat, but also uh, suitable places in their environment to cool down as well. So if they go above this, they, you know, they will be looking for wet areas, shaded areas, even underground areas to cool down again. But to heat up, because that's the main problem here, they, they need to heat up on a regular basis. They will mainly do this by basking in direct sunlight. OK, but they will also take heat from items that um, hold heat well uh, in their environment. So you can see this lizard here on a stone. I like to think that stone's a bit of a hot rock and that it's, it's using that rock to heat itself up from the bottom upwards. Um, and the majority of, of reptiles in, in the UK, at least, are what we call uh, heliothermic. So they use that sun to bask. Uh, but slow worms are something we call thegmothermic. They, they tend not to be found basking openly and they tend to heat up by using um, items in their environment and, and sitting underneath them most of the time. So they will on occasion bask, but they tend to be un found underneath things rather than on top of them. Um, just a side note that adders and common lizards are really efficient at thermoregulation. Um, it's probably the reason that adders are, that they have that thick set build uh, it gives them more surface area. Okay, so more surface area for the sun to hit them, but they will also be able to, they're able to flatten their bodies against things so that they can take heat through conduction efficiently as well. Um, and this is why we find adders so far north in, in Scotland uh, and even within the Arctic Circle, some places within the Arctic Circle, because they're just so good at reaching their preferred temperature range. So visual survey is what I want to talk to you first about. So let's just cover what a visual survey is. I mean, it, it does what it says on the tin, really. You just survey by going out and looking for reptiles. There's, there's you know, <laughs> no other way uh, of explaining it other than what it is. It's just looking for reptiles. But there's a few things that you want to consider. And this is the art of the visual survey, re really. It's identifying the right time in the right weather conditions, identifying the suitable habitat areas that reptiles might be using. And it's also really good practice uh, to follow what we call a transect when you're doing your visual surveys. Um, so a transect is normally just a, a route that you walk from A to B whilst you're looking out for your target species. Uh, and you can use Google Maps. The, the satellite function is a really handy tool um, to, to identify where you can set your transects. Um, but if you have prior knowledge of a site, you can set a transect uh, before you even go there, really. So when is the best time to go surveying? When's the best time to, to conduct a visual survey? Any time between February and October, really, is, is when you can do them. Okay, there's no hard and fast rules, but there's some guidelines you can follow. Okay. The best windows of opportunity are going to be between March and May. And then there's that dip in activity that I spoke about. 
and then again in September and, Octo and October. I would say this window, you're going to see less than you are in this window. So now marks the beginning of some of the best times that you can go out looking for reptiles. And you really need to tailor this to the weather and the time of day as well. So the mornings are always going to be better. But some people think that sort of early evenings are acceptable as well. The majority of your, your best survey results are going to be within this sort of time frame. And you need to um, tailor this based on the weather. So on really cold days, um, so think of that those cold, crisp February mornings uh, where you've still got quite a bit of bright sunshine, um, but it's really cold air temperature. You could probably go out later in the day. You could probably survey, starting at 10 o'clock and survey all the way through to one or two in the afternoon and see reptiles because they're going to be out longer. OK, the sun has brought them out, but the cold air temperature means that they have to bask longer to get to their preferred temperature range. OK, there's no point getting up at the crack of dawn in February or March when it's still three or four degrees air temperature outside. You're just not going to see them. They're not going to be out until later on in the day uh, until it's warmed up a little bit. Later on in the season, so perhaps towards May or June, when the air temperature is really hot, when it's, the ambient temperature is really warm, and it gets very hot in the morning, you are going to have to get out a bit earlier. Um, and if it's bright sunshine on those warm days, you're not going to have much luck. OK, the, the best times when it's really warm are those sort of hazy, cloudy days uh, where the, the reptiles aren't going to get direct sunshine and, you know, only require five minutes of basking and then they're off and then you won't see them. OK, so hopefully that's clear as mud. Um, the preferred temperature range is anywhere between 9 to 18. OK, but you will find them out when it's cooler than this. You will find them out when it's when it's warmer as well. But your best results are going to be when the air temperature is between 9 and 18. Any rain and wind just make it unsuitable for reptile surveys. So we're talking quite heavy rain and wind. Um, reptiles are going to be in cover at that time. Um, so I wouldn't recommend visual surveys in heavy rain or wind, with the exception being um, classic April showers where you get this quick downpour of rain and that cools the, the reptiles down. But then it's sunny immediately after and you think, oh, well, this is a great time for basking. And they go out into that uh, into the basking spots and try and heat up. So April showers tend to be quite nice times to, to do some survey work. And where to start? Um, this is a really difficult question because sometimes you'll just find reptiles in the most unlikely of places. And this is just to do with remnant populations. And um, even though habitat may have been great for them there, you know, 100 years ago, it's just got worse and worse and worse. But they're unable to colonize anywhere else. So the, that is where they've remained. Even if there's great habitat elsewhere that's quite near to them, they just might not be able to get there. So it's really difficult to say where you should start your visual surveys. But this is a list of some places that reptiles uh, are quite often found. So I've mentioned Heathland being excellent. Allotments, if you live in an urban area, are great for surveying for slow worms. South facing banks, like in this picture here in the bottom right, that's going to attract a lot of reptiles if they are in the area. But any one of these really is a good place to start. But what you're looking for really is a site that has diverse vegetation. OK, if there's short grass, medium grass, long grass, scrub, woodland, woodland edge, woodland canopies, the more diversity, the better it is for reptiles and the more chance that they're going to be there and that you're going to find them on your surveys. Um, so I don't, I don't think I've even mentioned what a, a visual encounter actually is. So the method is really, once you've got your transect, is just to walk relatively slowly, scanning ahead. Okay, and I'm gonna be talking about where you wanna be scanning in the next few slides. But as you're walking your transect, do tread quite lightly. Avoid casting shadows. Um, I like to have my shadow behind me. It's really difficult to see into your own shadow on a, on a sunny day, so it's probably best to have the sun 
um, overhead so it's casting your shadow behind you. Avoid casting shadows wherever you think that the reptiles might be because that will just startle them and they will disappear. Uh, listen for movement, that's really important. Common lizards, this is a common lizard, almost looks like a, um, a sand lizard with these, these spots, but it doesn't have the three rows of them, it just has them all over its body. Um, but common lizards in particular will scuttle off at the speed of light and you'll hear them before you see them. But if you're patient and you take you know, a few steps back, so you're three or four meters away from wherever you heard the noise, and they'll go back to the exact same spot. Literally, their, their, their feet will be in the exact same place that they originally were. They are creatures of habit. They have preferred basking spots and they will go back to that spot time and again um, once they think the danger has passed. So the more patient you are, the better uh, chances you'll have of finding them. Looking out for dumped refugia is great. You know, I would tailor my transects to include all plastic sheeting, road signs, tires, anything that might attract some things to be on top of them, like common lizards, but also things underneath them as well, like slow worms. And you could take a pair of binoculars with you as well. I mean, you could be looking for birds whilst you're out and about looking for reptiles. Um, it's really going to help you see them closer as well. Uh, and I've, I've got a picture of what mosaic basking is later on in the, the workshop. So a visual survey is great because it's super low effort. OK, you don't need massive amounts of planning. You don't need permission as long as there's public access. You don't even need equipment. OK, it's basically taking a leisurely walk somewhere you think you might see a reptile and giving it your best shot. So it's it's so accessible, okay? Just just going out looking for reptiles, and you know, working up your own experience in, in being able to predict whether reptiles um, are within a site or not. Uh, and they're certainly better on uh, earlier in the season. So when vegetation isn't very high, um, when reptiles are slower and sluggish, and they're basking more prevalently. Um, this is the, the better survey method. However, it's not so great at detecting slow worms because if you don't have things that you can look underneath, you're just not going to find them. And it's particularly bad at determining absence. OK, so if you go to a site seven or eight times um, a year and you didn't see a, a reptile, you can't necessarily say they're absent from that site there's a good chance you just didn't see them because they're so cryptic and um, perhaps you were unlucky. There's a number of reasons that you just might not have seen them. Um, and the, the next method we're going to look at is far better at saying, yes, there's a, there's a good chance that reptiles aren't here because we performed a minimum number of surveys. And also survey results aren't really comparable between different surveyors using this method. And to some extent, I would argue they're not comparable within the same survey, particularly if they lack experience. So this is down to something we call survey effort. You generally want to keep survey effort the same so that any differences in, in numbers is down to something other than your survey. Right, so if you imagine we've got surveyor A and surveyor B, they might be at very different levels of, of experience and there's gonna be a difference in how many reptiles they've seen on a site. That doesn't necessarily reflect that there are more or less reptiles on that site, it just reflects the difference in skill between those surveyors. And equally, you're just gonna get better at visual surveys year on, year out. If you start your surveys tomorrow on a site and you keep you know, meticulous records for 10 years, it will probably look like you're seeing more every single year. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that the population is getting bigger. It might just mean you're getting, getting better at spotting reptiles. OK, so the, the survey effort really isn't very standardised when we use visual surveys. And just, yeah, I think I mentioned this. This survey, this survey method does get more difficult later on in the year where vegetation has grown and it gets really dense and reptiles are going to be more active. Um, you're just not going to see as many reptiles. 
The other method that we use is called um, tinning or reptile mats or artificial cover objects where we just use something in the environment that the reptiles are drawn to as a basking spot and then we check those objects periodically. Uh, and basically everything good about visual surveys and everything bad about visual surveys is just the opposite <laughs> for um is just the opposite for, for artificial refugia. Okay, so this is a picture of one here. It's usually just some sort of roofing material. Uh, so whether that's tin, uh, bitumen or, or roofing felt that we place into the environment and then we check periodically. So it's really good method for all species. You'll find slow worms and snakes underneath them. Uh, you'll find common lizards on top of them. And it's really good at providing an estimation of abundance. Um, so someone's asking questions about individual recognition. You can use capture mark recapture to, to, to actually um, calculate the number of individuals within a site. And that really helps identifying which sites are key for reptiles, okay? And then you may link those sites up. You may provide more targeted habitat management. Uh, it's not so great because it, it's a lot of effort. Okay, you've got to store the mats. You've got to bed them in two or three weeks before you start your surveys. You've got to have quite a few mats on the site to ensure good coverage. The mats certainly aren't cheap. They're anywhere between seven and ten pounds per mat. Um, and not, you know, if you're doing this as a volunteer, you, you just don't have those resources really. And on top of that as well, you will need landowner permission to put these mats down. Believe it or not, a lot of people don't like having bits of discarded roof felt and weird cut out bits of tin all over their pristinely managed site. Who knew? Um, and to some degree as well, these can attract disturbance from the public. Uh, if they're not placed particularly strategically, um, people are going to be looking underneath them. They, they don't know what they are. People are inquisitive by nature and um, they'll be looking underneath them and they will be disturbing the reptiles. Like I said, if they're disturbed enough, reptiles will just stop using a site and they, they, won't, they won't be found anymore. Okay, so it can actually be detrimental if they're not placed in the right areas. So like I said, there's three main materials. Uh, corrugated metal or tin is usually considered the best material. There's a picture of it down here in the bottom left. Um, I would argue that Corrugated bitumen, some people call this onduline, yields just as good results as tin. And it's cheaper, it's easier to manage because you can cut it into different sizes. Um, it's lighter, so you can take it on and off site um, easier as well. And it doesn't get nicked. Okay, so some people nick these and sell them in scrap metal yards. Um, I've never known anyone to, to take corrugated bitumen. Um, shed felt, I would say, is it's really only useful if you can't afford tin or bitumen. Um, it just doesn't hold heat as well. It doesn't provide the microclimate that reptiles need. The only species I've ever really found under shed felt um, is slow worms. Uh, snakes tend not to like it as much. Um, lizards might sit on top of it if, if the area is open enough. Definitely, if you can get hold of these two materials, they're way better. Um, and when you're using artificial refugia, you just press it as close down to the ground as possible. You actually want to kill all the vegetation underneath it. Um, so that's why you bed them in two or three weeks beforehand. And you want to place them towards the edge of dense vegetation. And this will act as cover um, for the, the reptile to get in and out. So you do want open habitat like short grassland here on the edge of scrub or on the edge of long grassland, maybe on the edge of woodland, but they need to be able to get in and out of it without really being seen. That's the, the main consideration. And you do need to put them in sunny locations, okay? What you're doing really is you're inviting reptiles to use your artificial refugia because they're warmer than anywhere else they might find on the site, okay? And it it will draw them to it once they know it's there and they will continue to use it because they know they have to spend the least amount of time at the earliest possible opportunity. 
And if you're not placing your cover objects in sunny locations, so it's not getting sun in the morning, but getting sun in the afternoon, they're not going to heat up and reptiles aren't going to use them. So you do need to make sure that they are getting the sun early in the morning. This is usually um, in places that, that face the south, really, so south facing locations. Uh, and like I said, you do need to keep them away from people. Um, you can't have them on the main paths of, of sites because they might just get nicked, but also it's just going to cause too much disturbance. OK, and that's not good for the reptiles. So try and keep them in areas that either um, the public aren't allowed or that they're just not going to see them. You know, by and large, it doesn't matter if one or two people take a look underneath it once a day or so. If multiple people are checking it every single day, you've got a problem. And keeping them away from livestock is probably probably for the best as well. Um, most places that are managed for conservation don't have very dense herds. Um, but if you use farmers herds for grazing, um, they're just going to get trampled on. Shed felt and bitumen will get chewed on. And that it's just not going to be good for you. It's not going to be good for the reptiles either. Um, so try and keep them away from livestock if you can. You tend to want to use between five and ten per hectare. I always forget what a hectare is. I think it's 100 by 100 metres. Um, so that's not a huge amount of space, really. 100 metres by 100 metres is quite small. If it's really good habitat, I would recommend using more mats because there's more chance the reptiles are going to be using them. So you want to maximise your chances of finding them. Um, when they're 7 to 10 pounds a pot, you can see how quickly the costs rack up. Uh, but that's generally the recommendation on how many you, you, you use. Um, and you can be a bit cheeky and you can use pre-existing refugia. So like I said on your transects, if you have anything like this, any of these items I've listed here, um, keep them on your site if you can, because they may be attracting reptiles. Um, I mean, I guess the exception to that is if they're dangerous and I mean, I don't know about that, but if you've got children on your site and you've got rusty old metal with all manner of nails poking out of it, you should probably remove it. But you can use pre-existing refugia in your your surveys. That's certainly no crime. Um, and this is this tends to be what they look like. So this is the shed felt here. This is cut to half a meter by half a meter, which is a little bit small in my opinion. You want them ideally a meter by half a meter, so twice the size of this. Um, but sometimes you just don't have the space <laughs> to work with. So half a meter by half a meter is fine. And labeling them is a really good idea. So label them, so try and ask people not to, to touch them, but also you can label them with a number. Um, so if you, you've put 30 out on a site, when you're bringing them back in again um, at the end of the season, you'll know that you've got all 30 and perhaps which ones are missing. And by numbering them as well, you can plot them onto maps and you can share those maps with other people. But also later on in the year, the vegetation is going to grow around them and you'll have no idea where they are. If you have a map saying number 30 is going to be over here, you know where it's going to be and it'll be far easier for you to find them. If you do end up using maps, you will inevitably lose them <laughs> um, just to vegetation growth. It's just sometimes you'll never find some that you place down. So this is the corrugated bitumen. This is, I think, the best material. I think it's just a great overall mix of, of good cost and um, tractability and, and usage by the reptiles. Um, and that's the perfect size for them, really. So meter by half a meter. And it's really easy to cut with just the hacksaw um, and some WD-40. Try doing that with a tin. You, you, you'd need an angle grinder really to do that. You need a specialist really to cut them up for you. Um, okay, so combining those two, two survey methods, let's take a look at some pictures of some sites I've worked on in the past. And what I really want to, to, to really just nail home is where you want to be looking in your visual surveys and where you want to be placing the mats in your refugia surveys. Okay, and if you take away anything from this, um, from this workshop, it's look at the habitat interfaces. Okay, look at the places where one habitat um, transitions into another habitat. 
okay, whether that's short to medium grass, medium to long grass, scrub to short grass, wherever there's a transitional area, there's a good chance that you'll find a reptile there. Doesn't matter what the habitat type is, reptiles are very rarely found in the middle of it. They're normally found at the edges. Okay, so we've got some heathland here, we've got some patches of heather, some scrub. Um, if I was here, I wouldn't be looking in the middle of this grass. I wouldn't even be looking in the middle of the heather. I'd be going around the very edges of these clumps of heather and looking between where they meet the bare earth and the grass. Okay, that's where I'd be walking. That's where I'd be training my gaze. That's where I'd be looking in my visual surveys. If I was to leave some mats, that's where I'd be placing them as well. They're not going to go into the middle here where my mouse cursor is. That's a naff place to put them. You just, you, it's not going to attract anything. They need to be at the edges of the habitat, the habitat interface. The edges of path provide really good transitional zones. Okay, so the, the main paths on sites tend not to be so great just because of the, the amount of disturbance they're gonna, they're gonna attract from dogs and, and walkers. But these little off the beaten track paths, if you follow my mouse cursor here, you can just about see a little path here that I found on one of my sites. And that's where I'd be looking at the edges of the path where it meets the, the heather. Wouldn't be looking in the middle here. I may consider going up here and looking at where these trees meet the heather. The edges of path, paths less trodden, uh, provide really good places to look for reptiles. Any sites where you have that varied height structure, it's just going to be a really good place to start. So, you know, even woodland edge is good, but you want that variation of height when it comes to choosing your sites for surveying. Anywhere that just has one you know, like a monoculture of habitat, it's just not going to provide as, as much as, other, you know, another site might. Um, so here in this image, early on in the season, I'd be looking at this stone wall and thinking that is an excellent place for reptiles to hibernate. And I might find them at the bottom of this stone wall, particularly, you know, February and March, maybe even at the top of the stone wall because they just crumple out to the nearest sunny patch and um, but later on in the season I might consider this the edge of this path here maybe that's where I place a mat you know but I won't be looking in the middle of this sort of dank of vegetation I'd be looking at where the stone wall meets the vegetation and then where that vegetation meets that green lane and any areas you know of that are south facing and they get sunlight first thing in the morning and all throughout the day. Good places to start your surveys and place some mats. This is somewhere just like that. This gets sun first thing in the morning and it's got this sort of short grassland here, almost looks like dead hedging here and then leading into some thicker scrub at the back. So, you know, fairly good variation of uh, vegetation here. But what's important that it's south facing, getting lots of sunlight. And this is mosaic basking. OK, so snakes are really difficult to see when they're mosaic basking. Don't make, you know, don't let this, this picture fool you. This is, if you were to see this um, out in the field, you've done a good job because this makes them really difficult to see. Uh, it's adders mainly that do a lot of mosaic basking. This is exactly where we expect to find them in the short vegetation right next to somewhere that they can slither off into cover when they're disturbed. Uh, common lizards will, will climb sometimes to get to the, the highest point um, that's sunny, particularly if there's a lot of um, dense vegetation. They like to get on top of things just to get to the sunniest patch. Uh, they always prefer just open areas that are sunny. You keep your eye on top of like short fencing or log piles for common lizards. Grass snakes are usually found around water, um, but later on in the season, they will quite often be found in water as well. So when you're walking around ponds and small lakes, uh, perhaps keep your, eye, keep your eye in the water as well. Um, 
And this is the app that we use for biological recording. So if you're not currently using um, a, you know, an app or you're not familiar of any recording schemes for reptiles, um, I'm sure Emily mentioned this, so I'm not gonna talk too much about it. Please down, download our Dragon Finder app. Just type Dragon Finder into um, Play, Play, Play Store or Apple Play, um, and it will come up with an app that helps you identify amphibians and reptiles few other cool features like playing back and um, amphibian calls but its primary function is to send us biological data wherever you are it will take a snapshot of, of what your location is and then you pop in what species you found we get that on our database we can use that information to target certain areas throughout the country that might need habitat work we use it for putting together funding bids but we also share it with the national biodiversity network as well which um, ultimately is, is the, the best place for all biological data really to end up. Okay, so we do make sure that this data that we receive is publicly available. Um, and we need your help, <laughs> really. Like I said at the start, we lack data on reptiles. Um, we need more of it. And we need people to carry out visual surveys in their local areas. So hopefully you know how to do that now. You know how to identify reptiles and you know how to employ some survey methods. So consider where might be best that's local to you and try and do two to four surveys um, in the next, next few months, hopefully. And I've got a bit of a challenge for you. And I've really just added this slide um, for this group. Uh, this, isn't, this isn't one I do for every group. Um, I have a little bit of money to, to supply some groups with uh, refugia. So what I want you to do is I want you to assess your local area for, for, for areas that might be suitable to survey. Okay, and does that area contain suitable areas for refugia? So not all areas will. Okay, so some areas might only be suitable for visual surveys. But do you have anywhere local to you that you could use refugia? And you can use online resources for identifying these sites. So the National Biodiversity Network Atlas is really good. Google Maps satellite imagery is good as well. But ask, ask Debbie for, for, for good sites to, to start with as well. And um, I mean, she had a few listed at the beginning of this, this workshop. And what I want you to do is take some pictures of this, of this suitable habitat and point out where you would place the refugia. And if I get enough response from you guys, I will supply, um, the Wildlife Trust at Brandon Marsh with some maps that you can go and use in those areas and hopefully um, you'll get some reptiles, okay? And mats are far better, um, using the refugia mats is a far better method really than just doing visual surveys. Um, so this is really open to you guys. If you, if you think you'll use the maps and I get a good enough response, um, from you guys, I will, I will get some maps out to you and hopefully we'll get some more records of reptiles within your local area. Um, we've got about 10 minutes left and I wanna quickly, what, I mean, what's, what's a, a webinar without an identification quiz? Um, I really wanna give you guys a bit of an opportunity to flex your ID muscles and to assess whether you were listening at the beginning of the session. So I'm gonna throw up, I think about eight pictures and I want you to try and identify the species. Uh, so we're gonna do this by poll. And if you can, I want you to identify the sets. You might not be able to do this for all of them because you just won't have the information available. But if you think you can guess it, um, put down male or female. And if you don't think you've got the information, just don't put anything at all. So this is the first one. Hopefully a poll has popped up on your screen. I'm gonna give you between 30 and 40 seconds just to guess what you think this is. So there's a list of species as question one, and then see if you think there's enough information to guess the sex.
Okay, I'm going to give you just a little bit longer for um, I know 100% of voting. I don't even need to. <laughs> um, sometimes it takes people a little longer to get used to the polling. Okay, let me share the results with you. Um, so everybody voted. So that's fantastic. You're all you're all awake and listening. Um, and the majority of you got this right as the adder. So this is an adder. So we know it's the adder because it's got the zigzag pattern here. You can maybe just about see the eye as well. It's not too clear, but that is a red iris with a vertical pupil. It's that zigzag pattern that really gives it away as an adder. If this was a grass snake, we would definitely expect to see the yellow collar behind the head. Maybe we could see its eye with the circular pupils and it would certainly be a more greenish colour. Split between the middle between male and female, and I can see why. It's not like any of the images I showed you earlier. I think this is male because it has a black zigzag pattern and a greyish, maybe dull brown body coloration. I, I, it's not really brown though, is it? It's, it's more of a grey off white than anything else. If that was a female, it would more likely have um, a dark brown zigzag pattern with a lighter brown body coloration. But you don't know. This, this could be a female with very strange individual markings. You would need a closer examination to really tell whether that's male or female. But I would agree with the 47% the of you that said male on that one. Okay, next image. Vote away. I don't think I, I didn't mention in the last one that the, these are all anonymous, so I can't see who's voting. I just see the number of people that have voted and what they voted for. So vote away with impunity, even if you don't know, um, because you cannot be named, you cannot be shamed. Um, I suppose that makes it worse for everybody that gets all of these right, because you can't be held on a pedestal either. But they are anonymous, so please don't be too worried about um about getting it wrong. Okie doke, right. Majority of you got this as a common lizard. Fantastic, that's what I wanna see. This is a common lizard. So we can see that it's a common lizard because it has short head, short limbs. It doesn't have eye spots which we would expect to see on a sand lizard. Um, and I would agree with the majority of you who voted female as well. The dark flanks here, I think give it away as a female. We can't really see the top of it. So we can't examine the vertebral line. We can't see whether it has more flex and dots, which would give it, perhaps give it away as a male. These dark flanks, I think, suggest it's a female. It could be a male. I don't know for sure. Again, you would need close examination on uh, the, the base of its tail and its, its cloaca as to whether that was male or female. But I, I would agree with the majority on, on the fact that it's got dark flanks, probably a female. Well done to everyone that got it as common lizard. Okay, I wanna finish up in the next five minutes. I'm gonna try and rush through these a little bit quicker so that I can take questions at the end. Um, but after the ID quiz, uh, there's not a whole lot to say. So just anybody that's worried about the time. Um, so please vote on number three. What do you think this is? And I have to say a lot of these images are relatively clear um, and, and provide quite nice shots of the individuals. <laughs> Don't expect to, to see them like this in the wild. You'll see them for like milliseconds and you'll see a small proportion of them, um, which makes it quite difficult. Um, but I guess it's never, it's never good to start hard, is it? It's much better to start easy. Um, I'm gonna end the poll there, and it's great to see that you've all got this as grass steak, which is excellent. Um, yep, 
you can see the yellow color here. You can see the circular pupils with the yellow iris. You can see the dark bars as well. Everything there giving it away as the grass snake and not as any of our other snakes that we have. I would probably agree that this was male as well, um, but I definitely would accept um, to be proven wrong on this. But it looks quite skinny, quite small. The head doesn't look arrow shaped. I can't see the tail, so I can't make a comment on that. Um, but I would maybe guess this is a male just based on the, the head size and the, the head proportions and possibly the body proportions as well. So well done to everybody that got that. Moving on to number four. What have we got here? Give a few more seconds. Right. We have a slow worm in this picture. So well done to everybody that got that right. So we can tell it is a slow worm um, because it has just, you can just about see there, a bit of a stumpy head. Okay, it's got the neonatal line starting here fading into the body. It's got dark colored flanks with a bronze body coloration, giving it away as a female slow worm. This is definitely a female slow worm. Um, they do often get confused. Oh, it causes a lot of confusion to people because smooth snakes, people think, well, they're probably smooth, right? And you can see how smooth the skin is of a, um, a slow worm. It has scales, but it doesn't have the definition that the snakes and lizards have in their scales. You could run your hand down it and it would feel very, very sleek. You know, it's so sleek here, you can see the reflection of the sun. Smooth snakes, on the other hand, have individual scalation, but they have no keel on the scale. So a keel is like a, a raised ridge in the middle of each individual scale. And our adders and grass snakes have keels. So if you run your hand across the scale, you'll feel this, this ridge. Smooth snakes, on the other hand, lack any keel. They have smooth scales. So even though, by all, by all definitions, a, a slow worm is smoother than a smooth snake, it's that the smooth snake lacks the, the keels that gives it its name. And so this is a, a slow worm. So well done to everyone got, that got that. And it is indeed a female. Okay, I'm actually going to skip this one because I haven't included it in the list. <laughs> um, this is a red herring. This is a small newt. Hopefully you saw this and you were like, hang on, this isn't, this isn't a lizard. It's not a lizard. It's supposed to throw you off. But I've not included a, a newt as an option here. So we're going to skip over this one, go straight to this one. What do we have? There you go, pulls back up. Okay, last few seconds. And pulling there. A bit of a split here. Um, so this is the uh, another adder. So well done to everyone that everyone that got that right. This is quite a strange zigzag pattern. So I said that they are quite variable, and this is a really good example of it. It looks more uh, wavy than it does zigzaggy. 
but this is indeed a female adder. So it's definitely a female because it's light brown with a dark brown zigzag. Um, males can't have brown, brown zigzags, they always have black zigzags. Um, you can't see the eye, but can you see how thick that body is? Okay, so a grass snake, an Asculapian snake and smooth snakes have quite thin, long bodies in comparison to snake uh, adders, which have stocky bodies. So the stocky body really gives it away as an adder, but that's, that patterning on top of it, it's just an adder. You know, in, in any iteration, it's going to be an adder. You just don't get patterning like that on any of the other snakes you'll find in the UK. So well done to those that got female adder. Moving on to the second last one. What do we have here? Give you about five more seconds. Well done to everybody that voted slow worm. This is indeed a slow worm. So there's no distinction between the head and the body. Very smooth skin. <laughs> Again, that's the misnomer with the smooth snake. You can see a few, few blue spots here, 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 here. This gives it away as a male slow worm, okay? If it was a smooth snake, we would be able to see the individual scales. It would have more distinction between the head and the, the body. We would probably see a double row of brown, brown dark brown spots on a, on a smooth snake and possibly the, the eye stripe that runs through its eye as well. So well done to all of you that got the slow worm there. Moving on to the last image now. Give you five more seconds or so. Just sharing the results. And it's good to see the majority of you voted grass snake. So, the, yeah, this is definitely a grass snake. Dark green, olivish body color. You can see the dark bars on the flanks. You can just about see that yellow collar blurred in the foreground there. It's also really important to, um, to use the, the environmental information as well, the, the information on the habitat. Uh, grass snakes we know are usually found in water. This looks like it's about to go into the water. Um, so that's really important to consider as well. And I would probably agree with the majority, of the majority of you that said female as well. This looks like quite a large snake and the biggest grass snakes we find uh, are going, going to be female, um, but I wouldn't say that with certainty. It might just be an abnormally large male, uh, but well done to everyone that got grass snake and female. Um, so that's the end of the, the ID quiz. So thank you for taking part. Um, there was quite a few in there that I sort of few answers on there that I never touched on. So I didn't have any pictures of the non-natives or the, the rare species. And that's really because you're not going to see them. <laughs> um, it's the common and widespread species that you really need to learn because without a doubt, those are the ones that you're going to find on your surveys. So those are the really important ones to learn. Uh, but well done, because most of you got the, you know, the majority of them right. So I'm really glad to see that. Um, and that brings us to the end of the workshop, really. Uh, so thank you all for, for attending. Um, I really appreciate time uh, that you've put in to, to, to get into the end really. Um, but thank you to the uh, National Lottery Heritage Fund as well who 
not only have um, funded the 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 Wildlife Trust project, but they've also funded this project as well. 